1947, YB1736-57, made its final flight. My name is Greg Sathatis, this is B17 Archaeology, and welcome to our YouTube channel. Now this B-17 has some very historical facts that made this one very special. In 1938, in Langley, Virginia, on some routine test flights, they flew into a thundercloud. The cloud was so intense that the plane had actually inverted and was falling out of the sky and miraculously corrected itself. Now when the plane landed after the thundercloud, they came back and one wing was bent. Rivets were popped, but the B-17 flew. Because of that flight with this B-17 is the reason the Army Air Corps chose the B-17 as the heavy bomber. And we took it over to Europe and it opened up a can of whoop ass on Nazi Germany. So because of this plane, that's why we have B-17s. Now when it came in here, it was actually stationed here at Marsh Field and it was on a routine training accident or it was on a routine training flight, excuse me. And unfortunately six airmen died in this crash. There was no explosion, which leads to believe that the plane was actually out of fuel. Now because of the fuel bladders being rubber, they did not burst, they did not crack, they just bent with the plane as it slammed in to this mountain, killing all six airmen. All right, so gotta head on down here. We'll get to a certain point and then I'll point out the actual crash site. All right, so every time I come up especially about 7,000 feet altitude, get a little winded. So I always look for pieces, especially after a rainstorm or, or after we have windy areas because the earth turns. When I go to crash sites, it's always after rainy season because the earth reveals all the treasures and you know the relics for the airplane. So now this gets pretty steep. And every time I go, I always look in the cracks or after the rain because you never know and <laughs> what you're gonna find in fact something like this <laughs> all right one minute. So, just as the rock runoff would meet the dirt, end up finding an artifact. Now this actually isn't part of the B-17, but what it is, is an Alyssa men's belt buckle. So out of one of the six airmen on board, I'm holding a piece of, of his clothing, his uniform, that was on that fatal day that he ended up uh, not making it out of the crash site. So this is actually really cool. And I have the airmen's names, I'll give them to you in a minute. Once I can breathe and read, I gotta find my glasses and we'll do that. So yeah, always find some stuff. There's a reason why we find it. Um, I know there was a list of men on here, it wasn't just officers, but this is actually really cool. So, you know what? I'll, I'll tell you more about this one later. Um, but there's always, there's cool stuff, always after a rain. So, uh, I'll keep looking around and let me get to another spot so we can film. But basically, this is the rock that stopped the B-17 from 120 to 130 miles an hour to an absolute dead stop. So items like this were just thrown and jammed in there. So this is actually a really very special, very neat piece 
to find here on this crash site. So, this is where the B-17 stationed at March. Now, the Y-1 B-17s all became B-17A models. As soon as the Army Corps accepted them, they dropped the Y designation and became B-17As. And they were all transferred from Langley to March Field, and they became part of the 19th Bomb Group. So, I mean, for such a beautiful place, what happened here back in 1940 is a shame. We lost six airmen on this day. Now, a fact people don't really know is the 8th Air Force lost a little over 45,000 airmen during World War II. All the Marines in the South Pacific were about 45,000. In training accidents alone, over 15,000 airmen lost their lives and never made it to either campaign. And out of those 15,000, it was 54,000 aircraft uh, crashed during World War II in training accidents alone. Out of the 54,000, 200 were from Marchfield alone. So you can see these numbers. These, these are young men who signed up to go fight the war, to protect the United States, so that you and I can do what we do. I can be here on YouTube channel preserving history because of what these young men did. And these 15,000, they wore the uniform, but they never made it overseas. So God bless you and your families, and thank you for every airman who, uh, every military person, whoever put on a uniform, whether it was peacetime or wartime, I personally thank you. My family thanks you. Uh, I love every one of you, each and every one of you and your families. Thank you for your sacrifices. Okay, I haven't been to this crash site in eight to 10 years. So I was 45 when I came here last. Altitude hasn't changed, so I don't know what the problem is. But the train, <laughs> actually this is kind of fun, but the train is pretty, pretty steep in some spots. But to be able to get here and tell the story, because not everybody knows about these crash sites. So what we do, other than have a lot of fun, is we preserve history. So everything we're doing is preserving history. Now my son's telling me to walk forward, but if we pan down, <laughs> I have no room to walk. So here we go. So as we tell history, <laughs> so that we can help keep the memories of this airman alive. <laughs> That's good. So now we're at 8,025 feet. I want to show you the crew that helps me. This is my son, Greg, my grandson, Oliver, and my daughter Kelly. So this is our crew. And uh, <laughs> somebody's not ha real happy. Say hi, Oliver. <laughs> Oliver. All right. So that's our crew. Okay. So I have a list of the airmen who perished on December 18th. First Lieutenant John Turner was a pilot. First Lieutenant Donald Ward was the co-pilot. First Lieutenant Vernon McClary was the navigator. Staff Sergeant Thomas Sweet was the engineer. Corporal Frank Jarek was just an airman, most likely a gunner. And then we have Private Sessions, and he was a radio operator. So those are the names of the airmen that perished in this crash site here in the Idlewild Mountains, California, not more than 40 miles from March Field, which is now March Air Reserve Base, 
and home of Marchfield Air Museum. There's nothing the family wouldn't do to preserve history. Look at this teamwork right there. So now I get the easy job. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Hold on, Oliver. Oh. 8,000. 90 feet. Oliver on his journey. His daddy on his journey. <laughs> Mom, just laughing at them both. <laughs> Alright, so Oliver in here. <laughs> we have a message for you. Hold on, Oliver. Let's do it. Ready? So we want you to like us and subscribe to our YouTube channel, B17 Archaeology. Tell your friends. Tell everybody. Because Oliver thinks you should listen. I'm back at my desk after our road trip to the Idlewild Mountains in Southern California where we visited the crash site of Y1B1736-157. Now that B-17 was stationed at March Field Air Museum like I mentioned while we were up there and back in the 40s there was a magazine, very popular magazine, Popular Mechanics, go figure. So in this magazine actually has the B-17s that were stationed, the Y1B17s, that later became the A models, were actually stationed here. So, kind of a cool book. I uh, wanted to touch bases on that and also let you know, because of the COVID thing going on, we actually have a documentary series, Surviving B-17s. But with the COVID, we cannot interview veterans. A lot of museums are closed. We can't get up and close personal with the curators and any other interviewees. So we've decided to take it to our YouTube channel. So we will be redoing the episodes in a Reader's Digest version of Stardust Rat at March Field Air Museum, Preston's Pride, which is in Tulare, California, and Miss Angela, which is at the Palm Springs Air Museum. So we're going to be doing it without the interviews. Uh, we're just going to be telling the story about the airplane and, and what they did where they came from and how they came to be where they are today and what the future holds for each of them so we'll be doing that I uh, want to make this very informative very lighthearted fun but there's some serious stuff so yesterday when I found the belt buckle told you it was in the list of men's belt buckle um, so what we have is the list Whoop. see there's some funny stuff uh, we have the list of the possible three airmen it could be. This could be the belt buckle of Staff Sergeant Thomas Sweet, Corporal Frank Jacques, and Private James Sessions. The other three were officers, and this is one of the three airmen. Now, I've been told that uh, people love the show, people like what I'm doing. They say, you're going to be very successful. Now, what makes me successful is not the money. I've never cared about the money. This is about the veterans. This is about preserving history. So the money, it takes money to operate, but never about the money. That's not who I am. So I've always said when somebody comes up to me and says, thank you, because I filled in a gap. Uh, I told a story. I found something out about their family. That's when I'm successful. And to this date, I have been successful over and over and over again. So I will continue to do what we do, uh, being able to do this. Uh, when we were up there yesterday, besides the belt buck, I found a couple pieces. This is actually part of a wing, and you can tell because it's the corrugated thing. That's what gave the wing strength. On the, and then the outside was just the flat skin. We have a bomb shackle that came out of the bomb bag. So this would actually hold the shackle that held the bomb that would be released. So I have three identifiable pieces that uh, by chance found yesterday. And over the years, people, because of what I do, have been sending me pieces to this particular airplane. So I don't keep them for myself. They would be going to Marchfield Air Museum where a display will be built in the operations center with these pieces because this was a Marchfield 
airplane crash. So they will be on, on display for everybody to enjoy. It's about preserving history. If they're sitting in my personal collection, nobody sees it but me and I enjoy them. This way, everybody who visits the museum will know about these six airmen and their fatal flight on that uh, day, December 18th of 1940. So it's, it's incredible what we do. And because of this belt buckle, and I have done this before, if you will go and subscribe to us and comment, if you have a family member that served, please give us as much information. If you want to email me privately, please do that. It's greg at b17archaeology.com. You can email me the information, but please subscribe and put in comments that you would like to know more about your family. We will do our very best to research, find out what your family member did during the war, whether they ever made it overseas. But if they took the oath and they put the uniform on, they are actually a true veteran and an American hero. And we want to be able to help you with your family heritage and give you as much information as you can. And with that, everybody who comments with that, we will draw randomly and do a small segment in each of our YouTube channel videos and tell your family story based by the information that we can find. We will share it with you first, and if you're okay that we share your story, we will share it. If you want to keep it private, very much respectful. We will uh, keep it respectful as long as you get the information. That's what really counts, that we can preserve history. So we'll be doing all that. I want to make it fun. I want to make it light. Yesterday when we were up there and I introduced my son, my daughter-in-law, and my grandson, and I called him Oliver, people probably thought, what the heck? Why does he uh, have a British accent? Now, dating myself, if you ever watched Green Acres, the main character was Oliver Douglas. His wife was European. Every time she spoke, she said, Oliver. That's where I got it from. It's just kind of a fun thing. He enjoys it, I hope. I know I do, but I want to be able to do that. So come back, subscribe to us, like us, enjoy history, help us preserve history. And remember, B-17 Archaeology is a cool place to be.